Hello, everyone. It's uh, Damon with MBTV, and uh, today's show topic is going to be about type preference. So there's, let's just uh, start this off with saying, uh, I have Daniel here, by the way, and let's start this off with saying that, whoa, I don't... you're good. Anyway, yeah, I just cut out for a second. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I want to start this off by saying that Trey uh, posted a video yesterday. Uh, regarding his INFJ preference. And uh, to my surprise, he got a lot of support. Um, it's really, really interesting to, to see. Well, it, it actually sparked some thoughts in my mind. Let me put it that way. Uh, some thoughts that went through my head were this. You know, a lot of people type is a journey. And I saw a few things that made me want to start this live stream with this particular topic about what type preference really is, right? So that's the area we're going to dive in today is really talking about what type of preference is and what is type, right, in general. So we're, we're going to, this is going to be a little foundational. We've talked about cognitive functions. We've talked about how the functions interrelate, type dynamics, all that stuff is there. So uh, I think Blake will be joining us in a few minutes. But with that being said, we're going to talk a lot about the type. Okay, so let's let's get this started. So if you really look at typology in general, what it is is an attempt to categorize information. Okay, uh, categorize a group of people or a people into a particular category. We're limited to 16 categories. Okay, so we have 16 categories in which we could potentially be with, with Myers-Briggs typing or Union typing, 16. With uh, Enneagram, we have nine. Then you have the wings, which obviously create more variations, but ultimately you have 16 categories. What uh, I've seen a lot online, is there's a lot of people who think that oh you're this or you're that or you're that so the question is that i have to ask is does everyone fit into the box perfectly do we all make the same decisions do all infjs get along do all enfjs get along do they all make the same decisions do they all make the same choices okay so this this is a this is a really fundamental example of what, what's actually going on with typology in general and the whole community. But this is something I really want to dive into. Uh, I, I will get prompted in just a second. I'm, I'm a little behind, so I apologize, but I will get prompted in just a second. Daniel, uh, what is your perspective on so far people, you know, claiming or proclaiming you to be I? <laughs> Would you mind sharing your particular perspective? Uh, you're on mute right now. Your particular oh. perspective uh, on that? Uh, on, on what, I'm sorry? On people claiming for you to be ISTJ or you are ISTJ. Oh, so first thing we need to get out of the way, guys, right, is that although, you know, Trey came out with a coming out video of him being an INFJ, uh, which was about was bound to happen, right? Um, you know, I'll actually be releasing um, an ENFJ video, okay, because I have not changed. I've actually reinforced my my preference to prefer ENFJ, you know, there's the idea, prefer uh, ENFJ. And, um, you know, like this idea, uh, I, I have a couple of ideas of, of what you talked about, Dan. It's like people, people can only know themselves so much, right, while talking to others. Because the first idea we're going to like really rely on is, you know, what is, you know, the average, you know, what, what are the average observations people are having of us? And so a lot of people out there who are just getting into Myers-Briggs and typology and, and personal growth, the first thing that they do is just to kind of like, whether it's MBTI or not, they, they really love feedback and feedback is good, right? But that's, that's for you to really transcribe and figure out why you are appearing or, or being in such a way, right? And so a lot of people in the MBTI community are even easier to do that because now they have the the, um, the psychology and understanding of cognitive functions and MBTI and um, you can hear me right okay and so yeah so like you know people have this preference to really share like their observations with you know with the people um, at interest right and um, you know there's a there's that fine line as you were talking about right where you know, we're trying to help people really say, like, you know, preference over being that type. Because in the example of Trey, he thought he was an ENTJ for a really long time. Then he thought he was an INTJ, perhaps. And then, you know, it re realistically, when you guys kind of merged, right, you know, he just seemed a little bit more like an, uh, an INFJ. 
And so I have, I have weekly calls with Trey guys, you know, I, I, you know, we have regular coaching sessions. Um, you know, we're, we're always actively growing with one another and, um, you know, he's definitely an INFJ. He's, he's got a lot of really cool, um, facets to him. You know, he's not the stereotypical INFJ, which is, which is interesting, but that's, that's like everybody else. Everybody's, you know, their own unique person. So, you know, there's, there should always be a fascination with, with everybody, you know, it's not just one types like rare and the other type is not, you know, everybody's individual and, and they, and you have unique preferences to make you who you are putting any other kind of typology aside, right? This is your life. And, you know, that's its own story you know, in itself, you know? So, uh, but yeah, I'm still, not, I'm still an ENFJ. Okay. Well, thank you, Daniel. And, uh, all right. So Trey came out with this particular video, Brian, you just asked the first part of this video. So Brian, just let me catch up real quick. Um, what this is about is just understanding the fundamentals of what typing is and what it isn't. What is type in general? We have 16 categories, right? In MBTI, nine in Enneagram, you have variations, of course, but you have 16 categories. So what, what's happening here is that a lot of people are just assuming that, oh yeah, an INFJ would never do this, or an INTJ would never do this, or an ENTJ would never do this. And to me, that is like thinking that there's only 16 types of people on the planet. And if you think that's the case, you're insane. Okay, now you can, you, group bunch, you can group a bunch of people into a category and say, okay, this is great. But uh, look at it. Daniel and I are both Caucasian, right? But Daniel <laughs> looks like he got more sunlight than I do, right? He looks like he got a little more sun than I. Is that I Italian? Is that Italian? Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're Italian. You can't be Caucasian then because you have Italian in your blood, oh, right? Shoot. No. So, not, not ENFJ. So the yeah. guy, guys, this is what I'm saying is that there's all these variations, but he will be typically classified as Caucasian, even though he may have a percentage of, say, you know, Eastern European or a percentage of Western European or a percentage of, you know, African or whatever else ethnicity he comes from, whatever else historical, uh, wherever else his family is from. The point is understanding that, you know, you can still pretty much group him in the Caucasian category. He's going to be different, though. He's going to have his own variations. So we have to understand this, that Daniel is not just a Frenchman. Daniel is... I have no French in me. I never even said I was French. Right. So if we look at the human variable and we understand that humans don't really perfectly fit into a category, what we have to realize is if we take the, the, the map of 16 types and let's put them in a grid, right? Let's lay right. the grid down. Uh, let's lay the grid down, right? Instead of looking at it like this, let's lay it down like this. And let's see people like all on top, right? People are naturally going to be categorized somewhere around a type. They may be closest to this type, right? So Daniel might be closest to Caucasian, even though he may have uh, Australian and he may have Aborigine. We don't know. You, right? you have no idea who I am, Damon. Yeah, we. You might have Aborigine for all I know. I, I, don't know. I might. You, you know, I may come from Ab Aborigine land. Yeah. We, well, yeah. You know, you don't know. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's that's my point is really getting into this this whole what is this preference thing. So what it means is that you prefer introversion over extroversion. If in the case of INFJ, you prefer intuition over sensing, you prefer feeling over thinking and you prefer judging over perceiving. OK, that's preference. What the word preference also does is get, instead of saying I am I am this using the word preference indicates that you have the ability to use the other functions. When you say that I am, it makes it sound like you don't have the ability to flex over to other functions. And to me, you're limiting yourself to type. Okay. I do want to differentiate Damon though. Okay, go ahead. On that topic of the I am, right? In spirituality and in personal growth, I am is a really powerful tool, right? But in the context mm -hmm. of, you know, using it in terms of like limiting beliefs, right? If, like if you say, I am a ISTP, I am an ENTJ, right? You know, that's kind of more limiting, right? That kind of boxes you up, like you were saying, versus like, I am like the ocean, right? You're embodying, you know, that, that visual, you know, it's a little right. different. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a difference there. But what, what we got to remember is that these are categories, right? Yeah. And we're never just the category. In fact, as a human, we're greater than the category we put ourselves in as far as typology goes. Always. Okay. So when we read these book descriptions of what type actually is, Okay, so if I pull up INTP, right? What it says for INTP is INTPs are independent problem solvers who excel at providing a detached, concise analysis of an idea or situation. They ask the difficult questions, challenging others themselves to find new logical approaches. Well, that's kind of uh, the horror effect. Anybody can kind of fit that category, right? Yeah. 
So what what we have to understand, hey, Daniel, I think you just shut I'm here. Off. I'm here. Your camera just disappeared. So what I'm saying <laughs> is that these descriptions are very, very vague. And there's a lot of that going on in typology. The descriptions are helped to validate. Now, obviously, this description gets a little more complex as we move down into this category. Yeah. Well, you okay. know, you know what though? Like, like you said in another video, Damon, people like they they find their type, like like majority of people. And it's it's not until like some, they meet somebody like me or you, we're like, you know what? Guess what? You found out your type. That's just the journey. That's just the beginning, right? Right. And you have to understand more about yourself. And when you start, you know, looking into other, you know, and you know, typologies like Enneagram and stuff, not to combine them, but to just start to investigate oneself on the journey. Um, that's when the real journey begins. It's not when you discover your type. It's when you start just exploring who you are, your tendencies, why it is that you do things, the cycles that you do throughout your life, what's holding you back, what will help you move forward, you know? Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's what I want people to start understanding is, Type is the subject's journey. It is not your journey or your responsibility to tell someone who's type, what type they are. Okay. Now, granted, as a friend or as a, somebody that may know more about type or cognitive function theory, you can suggest, hey, you know, uh, it appears to me that you prefer introversion over extroversion. Why is that? You know, why do you think you prefer it? That's fine. You can question. I mean, I'm not saying we are restricted from, you know, questioning. But as far as saying, no, you are this, that's, that's to me, it's pushing it too far. Because what we got to realize is at the end of the day, type doesn't change. And type is hardwired. Okay. Yeah. What I'm, so there is, a, there is a true preference there, regardless of what yeah. you find out. But the type, type is the journey. It doesn't matter what type. You're not causing anybody else harm. You're not causing anybody yeah. else pain by walking and being wrong about your own type. You're not causing anybody problems. I was actually, I was just giving my friend an example like this. My friend Chrissy, uh, she just came over yesterday, and, and we were going over that that last uh, interview we had with my friend Dan, uh, Mateo, and she knows him, and she was watching. She's like, "Is is it MBTI genetic? Is it nature versus nurture?" And I'm like, "It's a good question, right?" And I told her most MBTI is based more or less on you know like a genetic upbringing, but the idea is that you can be nurtured into preferences. I believe, like I I solely believe that you can condition, you can be conditioned, and you can condition yourself you know, based off of comfort and preference, right? Mm -hmm. I take me for example, like what did it say about me? Like I was, you know, I had like a, like a intimacy facet or, or something, you know, or, you know, it's cool. Like when you get, we really get into the facets and preferences guys, you really get to kind of explore why you prefer what you do and, and really kind of investigate that objectively. So the idea is to really objectively gauge, you know, your behavior and, and why it is that you do things to, you know, to create more, you know, future awareness for yourself, you know, to, to make your life better. Yeah, there's a lot of confounding uh, problems with taking type theory and moving it into the field of just categorization. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's where the biggest problem we're having right now is a lot of people are interjecting theory, which is F-E-T-E-F-I, all the cognitive functions. Okay, so I'm pretty sure they're there as far as like, what I've seen in research, I'm pretty sure the processes do actually exist. It's just we're tr still trying to understand the processes. We're still trying to make sense of the processes. And um, that's that's the key, is, is the understanding that these are two different things. Your Myers-Briggs type is just your preferences, and they're hardwired, like we said, but we learn to use other functions. We learn to use other functions, and just because you use it all the time doesn't mean you actually innately prefer it. Yeah, that's true. And like the idea is that the more you become aware of your 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 behaviors, right? Especially with your your like your shadow functions, for example, like how I how I would utilize introverted sensing within my day to day life. You know, all those things really kind of help me. It's not about what I'm what I'm strong or weak in, but it's how I it's how I carry myself throughout my life and and adapting for just you know a more happier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where I'm going with this whole whole topic today is really just diving into what the keyword is, why we, why we're using the word prefer. Okay. Cause a lot of people may think it's weird that I prefer using that word prefer. Can and I it's, go ahead? I want to interject there because like, for me, like, because you're, you have a type three, right? So like for you, you might be able to understand this, right? In Enneagram, right? Like I'm a type three. So like I, I, I kind of can give myself a, a particular image. Right. And the idea is that I'd rather say prefer because 
you know, for me to say that I'm just an ENFJ, right? It's very, it's limiting and it doesn't necessarily align with my, my technical character that I associate with, right? So for a type three Enneagram, just to like pause for a sec, you know, it's really about finding what's really suitable and, and favorable for myself and what's around me and, and really wanting that and striving for that kind of a self-achievement. And so like for MBTI, I, I really don't care about like being an ENFJ. I care about the preferences though. I care about what matters most in a practical sense and, and how it applies to my life. Because when you first get into MBTI and you can, you can linger in this purgatory forever. There's people who know MBTI for years, for like 15 or 20 years. And they're like, oh, I know so much. But yet they linger in the association of what type is like be, before you even get into preferences and facets and, and you know, wh why it is that you do things. And so to right. totally take a step back and say, you know, first of all, you know, I'm just Dan, I'm just a guy, I'm just a body, I'm like a vessel, and I just have a consciousness that I'm just kind of walking around with this with this flesh body, right? To call myself an ENFJ on top of that, it's like my mind's like, how can I even call myself that, right? This is these are just my tendencies based off of you know, that I manifest into the real world. You know what I mean? Right. And it's like you gotta look at it kind of like in an esoteric sense. It's just like, you know, these are all tools, right? MBTI is an indicator to help you indicate your own tendencies and your, you know, your own, your own things that you do. Yeah. And I've stated this before. Uh, MBTI is, it does all, almost all of its research into the typology section. It doesn't do a lot of research in the cognitive function section. Yeah. Okay. That research is, is, is more profound in socionics. It's more profound in other methods of typology that I probably even haven't heard of yet. Uh, those union functions, a lot of different union slants, uh, I was just looking at Model G today in Socionics, um, and that's my brain's been in, in heavy work mode today. So as far as like trying to under trying to get this out of my head, is some, sometimes it's a little it gets stressful at times because yeah. I've got so much floating around right now. It's like on ninety million miles per hour. But that being said, I want you guys to really also understand that you know we've we've done we've done a lot of research and trying to differentiate this and a lot of work trying to get you guys to understand the difference between not only typology but the in their union functions but to understand that you, that's why you can't really type yourself with the functions because what you're going to find is that since the function theory isn't so clear with a lot of people uh you may fully understand functions but yet still not know your own type and this is what yeah. happened this is what happened to trey because and trey handled it like a like a a pro. Do you, you want know, me to? And, do you want to go into why um, that was? Why what was? Why why it was easy to overlook for his case, or we can get into that in a second. Let me let me okay. let me finish this point real quick. So, okay. uh, like I said, Trey handled it like a pro because what he what he Trey knows the functions. He does. He truly knows the functions. The thing about Trey is he didn't understand himself enough. That and that's the process. Okay, so you know it's not like Trey. It's not like Trey didn't, uh, you know, ever question. Trey questions everything. He was constantly analyzing himself. But once he got out of the environment, which was causing him so much stress, it's like he immediately could see what started happening. It was like he started to return to his natural preference. And I was around to observe this, right? So Trey right. moved out of his home, and uh, now he can actually start to relax, and his natural preferences came to fruition. Okay? And – that's the that's the uh that's the key is understanding you can see when you take somebody out of the stressors in their life you can start seeing oh whoa okay you're not the person that i've been seeing this whole time okay so that's where that's where i think uh a lot of people are, are misunderstanding the, the process of type and that's his journey you know that's his journey to understand himself that's his yeah. perspective like and so with that being said, uh, Daniel, why don't you dive into your perspective and, you know, we're, Trey's not here to really address any of it, but I was, <laughs> but why don't you dive into your perspective of what, what happened with Trey? Why don't you, why don't you share? Yeah. So, and by the way, guys, this is actually a topic I'm going to be making a video about because it's such a cool idea. And so the idea is that what really happened with, with, uh, with Trey is that, you know, um, something called function looping, right. Or, or maybe like, like, relying on functions as the coupling, right? And relying on that, that system that you can create for yourself that may not necessarily be the most practical for yourself. And so an example of this is, uh, I, 
He's an INFJ. Trey is an INFJ for, for those of you watching who, who know Trey. He prefers uh, INFJ, but yeah. He, pref- he prefers INFJ. And so what he what, what one of his tendencies is, because he's, you know, um, he's, an, you know, prefers INFJ, right? Uh, he will intuit, right? He is, it's very apparent that he's very introvert intuitive. He's very into his thoughts. He's very, very spatial, very, you know, in his head, right? But the idea is that how INFJs or ENFJs for that matter, uh, more so ENFJs, really understand and, and can bridge the gap between uh, communication with people and to submit that information and data to their to their framework of you know introverted thinking, understanding that that value system. Um, uh, he he really was bypassing that that feeling element of getting to know people. So how that looked like was he would he would have all these thoughts about people. And then he would kind of overlook extroverted feeling because of a conflict that he has with extroverted feeling. Um, though it's very apparent in him, it's very underexpressed uh, because it, it's very it's it's his conflict function, right? And so the idea is that I want to explain that I feel like everybody has like some sense of a conflict with maybe you know their own way of of being, right? With with their functions, it's the idea that uh, for Trey, for example. You know, a lot of his ways of seeing people and the dynamic that he was creating, that that framework he was building inside was kind of foggy because without extroverted feeling for an INFJ, he can't truly gauge and and bridge the gap between understanding with his thoughts and getting that verified through people. And so what was happening is he was bypassing that going from NI right to TI and just taking his thoughts and understandings and making it a framework. And so when you do something like that, regardless of type, you can use that, you know, uh, you know, in any type, like for an ENFJ, it would be extroverted feeling right to sensing, right? And that would manifest in a different way. So the idea is that, you know, regardless of what type it may be, you know, it would be a good idea to really think about this idea in terms of, you know, what kind of conflicts do you avoid, right? I feel like there's like a functional conflict driven function, maybe, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And I want to explore that because, for Trey, it's extroverted feeling. And his association with extroverted feeling comes from his upbringing. You know, and it's very apparent. It's very apparent that when you ask Trey, you know, hey, could you just randomly go up to strangers and say hi to them and meet them and, and be very kind of good willed or altruistic maybe? You know, he actually, he has disdain for that. You know, he does not want to unless it's for a personal agenda to fuel his introverted intuition or to fuel his understanding of himself. And so the idea is that he tries to overcompensate for not using extroverted feeling by overcompensating with introverted feeling, uh, introverted intuition that much more. So it just perpetuates this cycle of like kind of building this like, or filling this like in ground pool of foggy water that you really can't see through. Right. And the water would be kind of, uh, the metaphor would be like the value system, right? The crystal clear value system, maybe an ISTP will present. And the idea is that once, you know, Trey really uh, evolves his uh, extroverted feeling, he's going to start relying on, he's going to start relying on it more. And what a healthy INFJ looks like when they do utilize their extroverted feeling to give you a comparison, you know, Trey's all about asking why, never really caring to validate his thoughts, right? Um, just to dump it into his, you know, his, his value system, a hel- you know, not, not saying a healthy INFJ, but an INFJ that uses their extroverted feeling to gauge and validate their intuitive thoughts about people. They'll ask, they'll actually sit and talk for maybe 20, to mi- 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or an hour or two hours. Then out of nowhere, they'll have, like, they'll just start asking you a whole bunch of questions about thoughts that they have about you or thoughts that they have about the conversation in general. And then they'll just, put that in their value system because that way they get a actual, they get like a valid kind of matching a pairing of their thoughts to what is actually real. Right. So I don't know if I explained that in a good way, Dana, yeah, but that's, I that's what I have. That's from my answer. Too, huh? before we get, I don't want to get too much into cognitive theory on this particular stream, yeah. uh, but I do want to talk about a little bit about the loop. Uh, there's a lot of theories on looping. There's a, there's a ridiculous uh, amount of theories on looping of what the tertiary temptation is. And yeah, I love the, the theory. temptation. Yeah, the theory is really, really interesting. The, the thing that what we have to understand is that it's very hard to take the theory and make it work into a model. Uh, 
I hope yeah. someday we can get a little further research can get into that. But the tertiary representation, so. let me put it this way. If you look at it from a functional standpoint, which means from the theoretical standpoint, right? Mm. Someone who prefers INFJ, let's say, you know, they prefer to, if they, when they're in their youth, they prefer to use a particular weapon to face the world. In the case of the INFJ, their weapon to face the world is extroverted feeling. Now, let's say that your circumstances and your life circumstances doesn't warrant the use of that particular function. For example, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Okay. Your extroverted feeling has failed you over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Right. So, if your extroverted feeling continues to fail you, you're human. You're going to learn and adapt, or you're not thinking at all, right? You, you got to go, okay, you know what? Wait, wait a second. This isn't working. Trey's particular situation is his environment didn't warrant him to be the person he is. Instead, it warranted him to retreat into his mind and analyze. Yeah. And the reason for it is because everybody who did anything kind for him, essentially, this is my understanding anyway. Trey can correct me at any time, but. Uh, any, any time that he demonstrated, anybody demonstrated feeling to him, there was always some kind of malicious intent attached to it. Okay. And this is normal. This is normal in a lot of families. So he naturally started looking at the same weapon and going, am I malicious? Am I morally corrupt? Do I have issues with my morality? Because everybody else is doing that. That's so, that's so malicious. So I don't want to use this tool anymore. Right. I don't trust this tool anymore. I don't trust the knife I brought to this gunfight anymore. Now it's time to fight. So he retreated into his logical side and started this hyper analysis loop. NI insight, analyze. NI insight, analyze. And he, he skipped that extroversion preference. He skipped it at all. So Trey happened to be stuck in his mind quite a bit. Yeah, and Brian, you're 100 percent correct. Uh, childhood is psychological warfare. That's that's 100 percent right. Um, that's where that's why we we tend to look over uh, these things because when you look at somebody on the surface, you go, okay, wow, that's it. You know, there you've got this. You've got this. Uh, you're, you don't fit the profile. Hmm. This doesn't sound like you, right? Well, why doesn't it sound like you? Yeah, and and the thing is because your life didn't warrant it, right? When I was younger. I will tell you, I was very, very oppressed myself. I was oppressed a lot. Okay, so where did I direct my dominant function? It wasn't in the world of people. You know, I'll tell you that. I was scared of people. And there was a reason why I was scared of people. Okay. And the, the, but that's not the topic of this discussion. However, the reason I was scared of people was the very reason why I directed my extroverted thinking to objects. I started building things on my own. Right. I started becoming resourceful on my own. So I used the tool in a different way. So I struggled with actually socializing for a long time. So I appeared introverted, but so badly in my core, I wanted to get in the spotlight so badly in my core. I wanted to be up front so badly in my core. I wanted to take charge. And that was that was the, 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 the desire I had. So the minute I went to middle school. I was still under a lot of oppression at this time. You know, I got kicked out of school because I, I started a gang. <laughs> and uh but it wasn't even a gang it was a group of people and it was a hierarchical system and the school dubbed it a gang right and they were like oh you know hey at the time <laughs> don't you got, you're gonna get suspended don't continue this but i was like i have to i have to have this. what's with damn, damn what's with the nj's and being repressed as hell in the beginning of our life i, I don't think, i don't get that i think the deal is the deal is i think everybody's repressed I know everybody's impressed. Yeah, I think everybody's That's impressed. True. Hence why they don't fit these perfect descriptions. These are like purity of type, which means that you're like smack in the middle of your type. There are people who do fit that, like to a T. Um, but then there's people that uh, don't fit it as well. For example, like we look at the personal variation that happened in Daniel's life. Like he said, he prefers an intimacy facet. So he kind of was on the border. Am I, do I prefer introversion or extroversion? Do I prefer introversion or extroversion, right? And in reality... He, he does prefer extroversion, but there were certain life circumstances which made extroverting harder. So he yeah. relied and developed a personal variation, which made his life a little bit easier at the time. A great example. A great example is, like I said, I had that intimacy facet. I grew up, you know, not having any kind of real, real close communication with anybody on a very deep level. And I, that's something I desired when I was a kid. I never got that from parents. I never had that 
I didn't have too many friends growing up. But then once I had that accessibility to people, kind of like in Damon's situation, I still had a lot of issues because I wasn't, I wasn't culturally or, you know, communicate communitively um, uh, approachable or 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 wanted or or you know acceptable until like I got kind of got out of high school. So, you know, when I got out of high school, that's when I really shined. You know, uh, it was just you know the social parameters that I was put in, you know, really initialize this 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 preference for wanting really close and intimate connections with people and uh that's just how i kind of grew up and as i met other enfjs you know it's not as strong but you know they have other things as well you know everybody has different preferences right and i, I can tell you you know even though i've been in myers Briggs, i've met other entjs we've had a lot of similarities but i felt so different still i met a lot of intjs felt so different i've never felt anybody was just like me like that's me I've never seen that. I've seen it in fiction, but I've never seen it in real life. And so right. that's where the, the challenge is where I'm like looking at these things and going, okay, so you have this, this, this dominant function uh, and the dominant function, it, it can be repressed. It can be directed differently. It can be moved in a different direction. And then there's this thing called type development, right? And so how do you develop your type? I can tell you right now, NJs in general, uh, from my personal observation, generally, this is a personal observation, okay? It's not canonical. It's not. I won't hold you accountable. I won't hold you accountable. Yeah. It's personal observation. <laughs> is that the NJs in general they mature quicker? My natural understanding of this and my natural reasoning for this, and they more mature quick more quickly than other types. At least what I've seen and heard in, in my typing experience as well. They always say they always felt like an old soul. My my reasoning for this is very simple. It's because they're not here presently, right? They, what I mean is they're, 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 they're trying to look at it from a big picture standpoint and pattern everything into one single point. So they, they tend to not look at the little things that it can temporarily excite you. It's instead, let that go and see what's actually happening and piecing together the big puzzle. So this is why NJs in, in general, like to, they feel very alienated in a lot of ways. So you'll see that most NJs, including ENTJs, this stereotype about ENTJs being the alpha male uh, is actually not, I wouldn't say that's accurate. I would say ESTJ kind of stands on top yeah. as far as the alpha. Yeah, um, or they you know, try to be. Yeah, the tribal alpha or the, the, the typical stereotype of alpha. ESTJ is doing what everybody, in a sense, prefers them, to society prefers to do. Yeah, right? it's, it's that guy right there, actually. Maybe he can tell us a little bit more about each, how he tries to be alpha. Well, yeah, well, we'll get to we'll get to Blake in just a second, but you know Blake is going to rip his shirt off and show his hairy chest and scream in primal rage. Okay? <laughs> yeah, but uh, you yeah, know it's it's the typical definition of that alpha is the person who has all the network who creates all the connections. Uh, this is easier in general for ESTJs, and what's the why is this easier for ESTJs? Is because uh, they they prefer the reality. Here's the tangible facts, whereas the NJs are typically looking at patterning everything. Okay. Yeah. And so that's, true. that's where uh, the NJs want to pattern everything. So they're like, okay, what is the sense of this? Because I'm looking at it long term. This is actually irrelevant right now. Whereas the SJs are like, no, that's what needs to be done. And I'm going to go do it. Okay. So that's where the, 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 the differentiation is. And I don't mean to put ESTJs on top of the food chain, but the typical stereo, typical side is that ENTJs are this alpha. And it does happen. I mean, yeah, naturally, as we learn to become and we develop our sensing function, it starts coming out, right? And they start looking more similar. ESTJ and the ENTJ start looking a lot more similar. But in the, yeah. the long run, I mean, we get closer. MBTI specifically states that we move to a, we have a starting point. And that starting point is our preference, type preference. How we grow from there is our personal choice, right? So we're right. growing from this personal perspective of, you know, hey, I've got this, this particular disadvantage, all right? And then I'm going to develop my type into a more fulfilling person, right? I'm going to start from square one, which is my type preferences. So that means as, as an ENTJ or someone who prefers ENTJ, I correct myself and I'm working on that, but someone who prefers the ENTJ, I start off with a preference for extroversion, a preference for intuition, preference for thinking and preference for judging. So let me tell you this, then I'm going to let Blake talk for a second about ESTJ, but let me start with this is that, I was kind of forced into introversion as a kid. 
like I said, I was, I directed my TE more toward objects than people. And, and because of that, I learned to develop introversion. So am I comfortable in my mind? Uh, more so than I, than I would expect naturally. Uh, I do not like it still, but I can do it. I can sit back and actually be in my mind and I can be alone for a while. That's fine. The second thing is, uh, you know, am I comfortable with data and details? Absolutely not. I still struggle with that quite a bit. And sometimes being even here right now, you know, I still have my insights and they become, they seem larger than life when they hit me. You know, do I struggle with thinking and feeling? Oh, I struggle with the feeling side a lot, right? I struggle with that quite a bit still. And then do I struggle with perceiving? Absolutely. My friends and people I've spent time with me to be like, hey, you need to be less structured. You need to be less regulated. Chill out, relax, learn to have fun. Learn to do things, learn to experience the moment. Stop trying to structure and regulate everybody. Stop trying to make everything hierarchical. Stop trying to make thing, everything orderly. Stop trying to control every situation in your life. Okay, so I have these natural tendencies and then I'm moving on that side and I'm learning to develop those particular aspects. And this is completely removed from cognitive theory. When you incorporate cognitive theory, it even makes more sense, but that's theory. It, it may be proven wrong someday. In fact, socionics, I was just looking at Model G earlier, like I said, and it's actually a totally different model of how the, the functions interrelate with each other. Okay, so Blake, would you share your experience about being e or preferring ESTJ? Oh yeah, definitely. I'd love to. Okay, so my mother, I'm pretty sure she is a INP. Um, and I, I, grew, I grew up in a household, like she was a teen mom, and there was, there was always, chaos we were always moving from place to place it wasn't like uh structure i performed best uh whenever there was a set of tasks to do whenever there was organization um i'd always ask my mom you know if she wants me to do chores make a list so that i can you know go off of it uh, eventually uh i found people in my life through books, through videos and audio podcasts that really resonate with me that happen to appeal to the, uh, the success, the organ, the organized, the logical thinking. And I've attached myself with them and, uh, really that they really helped me grow and develop into this mature or this better ESTJ that I am today. And, and I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, um, these people are successful, you know, whether it's their self-help gurus or they're multimillionaires. And I grew up with uh, lots of scarcity. Wanna, I, I didn't want that same thing to happen throughout the rest of my life. And I saw a lot of people slip up. A lot of people make mistakes, you know, like, like cheating on, like uh, my mom, she had her... Uh, her boyfriend of several years, cheat on her constantly. He was always being verbally abusive. I also saw how my dad liked to, uh, my dad liked to sleep around. He was always, you know, very, like his humor was f full on censor. Okay. I just, I, I, I strive not to be like them. As soon as I started seeing men in this world who were doing huge things, who were doing so much better things. I strive to be kind of like those people. What was it about so, them? What was it about them? Aside from them being no. a little bit more successful or? No, it's about me. It's always, it's always about me. I, I mean, I, I understand them. I, it's not like I look up to them. Uh, I'm not like crazy about the hierarchy and all that. I just, uh, I understand that they got to where they're at right now through forming specific habits and they did things, you know, the right way. So I want to incorporate some of the stuff that they did into my own life. So uh, this is a really good example. Blake, would you say that, that that came more natural to you is to kind of look at what they did and go, hey, that's a good reference point. I think that's, a, that's something that, uh, that comes natural to you. Would you say that was something that you learned? I'd say that is uh, something that really just comes natural to me. Okay. So guys that are watching, this is a really, really 
a good example that I know I always see when somebody says something, you always want to ask if it's their natural preference, right? So if somebody says, I prefer mm. to be in my mind, does that come natural to you or is that your life circumstance right now? Is that a situation for you, right? That's how we really get to the bottom of type because, you know, at any given time, I can be so uh, focused on what I'm doing that I'm actually like not even in reality, at least how I feel. And if you ask me, hey, is this how you naturally are? No, no, that's not normal. It happens sometimes. And you may catch me on an off day. But since Blake says this comes natural, kind of look at the examples he used to paint these pictures. Very concrete, makes a lot of sense. And hey, look, these guys did it, so I'm going to do it, right? Pretty concrete, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty simple. So I did the same thing, right? When I was younger, I was about uh, 20, 19, 18 at the time. And instead of looking at the people and going, those people are successful, I'm going to be successful, or those people are smart, and not, so I want to learn from them. It was none of that for me. It was more patterning for me. When I was younger, it was like looking at how those particular people uh, came across their goals. And I said, okay, that I get that, but is that really what I want to do? Is that is that method what I want to do? Is that their formula the only thing? Instead, I was it, they've released abstractions to me to help me paint my own path, okay? So it was a little different, yet Blake and I are on the same path today. <laughs> so we, we had different ways of approaching the same decision, okay? So this whole thing of nobody's gonna do, uh, because Blake and I have read a lot of the same people, we follow the same people, we, we, you know, we get information in the, from the same people. So Blake and I have a lot of common in that area. But you guys can look at it and go, how did we come across to reach these decisions? How did we actually make these decisions? And so I made it in the way that came natural to me was, was abstraction, was looking at the patterns of these people and going, this person, this person, this person, this person all did this same thing, but is that thing really going to work with this certain situation? No, it's not. So I took that thing, recrafted it and molded it in my own way. Okay. But yet here we are today. So the thing is that, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's uh, ludicrous to assume that certain types are going to behave in a certain way. And that's it. That's, that's law. That's not the case. Okay. Cause the decisions that we make on a daily basis are going to be very, very different or very similar, regardless of what our type is, right? Type is our own journey and we don't have to share it with anybody. It's to me, if you stick too much to your type, you're actually limiting yourself because you might actually subconsciously start creating excuses for certain behaviors instead of learning that, oh, because I prefer ENF or ENTJ in this case, or somebody prefers ENFJ like Daniel does, you know, that's not a reason not to use logic. And me preferring ENTJ is not a reason for me not to use feeling, right? Is it right for me? Is it morally right or on the human level, right for me to completely ignore, ignore morality or ethics or the human element? Does it make success? No, it, it doesn't make success. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't help you. Ultimately, I think ignoring those things are not good things. I think that there's a lot of aspects in here that we're actually missing. And it's important that we start looking at it in a, in a perspective that actually makes sense. And so when we read these type descriptions, like I said, with the, the things in this particular book, if you guys want to get this book, you just email me and I'll, I'll make sure I can get you a copy. But in the things in these books, these are the best type descriptions that I found to date, by the way. And um, in this book, you know, it gives you an overview of what the type may look like and some common tendencies, because you will have tendencies. A person who prefers thinking is not going to show as much feeling preference normally, right? If they're operating in preference. But we can't be under the assumption, this, this chat is really distracting. I have to make sure my eyes keep going to, I'm closing my, that out. Somebody else watch that chat for me. I'm watching it, so don't worry. Yeah, it's really distracting. Okay, so that being said, it's, um, it's ultimately making sure that we we understand that those variations that type is going to have a common tendencies but that doesn't mean it's law it doesn't mean that the type is strictly solidified to that one thing remember the people floating above the type chart where are they closest to that's what they're going to pick so if trey read all 16 types and infj resonated with his natural preference first and that's the one that he said you know i resonate with this 85 percent and the rest of them, 60%, 50%, 44%, 40, 35, 30, 20, 20, 10, 5, 5, whatever. He prefers the one that has the most resonation with him in his natural state. The problem with people have with type and why some experts in type still can't find their type is because they've learned so many variations, it's hard to dig in and find that natural preference. 
So as a practitioner, one of the things that I really struggle to do and really strive to do is hear key words, the, the key words in people's language that indicate preference, right? Like I had to, yeah, I chose to, I needed to, you know, those, or I have to, or, you know, um, I felt like it was necessary. Those particular things don't, they, they point that whatever that behavior is or that tendency is or how they came to that decision wasn't natural. They learned it or they developed it. The people with, the problem with these type people who come on and say, hey, you're not this type or you're not that type is they don't, they, they're under the assumption that everyone is operating within 100% of their preferences, 100% of the time. And that's not how yeah. the world works. Yeah. Right? That's not how the world works. Think about this. The function that you need to use for certain things, like sensing, right? Do you think if uh, you are in a fast-paced sport that uh, being, being a, uh, activating NI would be beneficial? <laughs> Do you? Probably not. I mean, yeah, it, it could be. But, uh, you know, if you've done any martial arts, you'll realize that they tell you not to think and you want to build the habit so you don't have to get into your head and try to predict the outcome because you're going to get knocked out. It's too fast. Um, and that's so being there in the present moment is probably the better process to use. So these are tools. The cognitive functions are tools. When I was learning martial arts as a kid, one thing I can tell you for certain is I had problems uh, predicting too much. It was always calculating what the next, the next move was. And sometimes so much that when I was wrong, it would catch me off guard, right? And so I didn't anticipate that, therefore, instead of being there in the moment, and that's what would catch me, instead of being sensing everything, where there's a person who taught me was so present, he preferred ISTP, by the way, but he was so present that he was aware of everything that was going on at any given time. So any, you really couldn't fool him much, you know, because he, he already, he was, he was in touch with it. And I remember a very specific quote that he, he, he told me, he said, he's like, I don't get hit for one reason. And to this day, I've never seen anybody even close to hit him. Uh, he told me, I don't get hit for one reason. I said, what's that? He said, right when someone throws a punch, I can feel the wind and I can hear the sound and I can see it. He's like, it all, I perceive it like that. And so he reacts to it. He's not in his mind calculating outcomes. He's actually right there in the moment. So the key is you use different functions. They're tools for you at any given time to use for your disposal. But you have those natural preferences, those things that come more natural to you. And that's the, the thing I can re remember, even in a social situation, I'm looking at everybody's pattern. Everybody's abstracting something to me and I'm piecing it together and I'm going, here's the, here's the execution method, right? So it's an insight. I deliver and I, I move that insight forward. I project into that insight into what I think is going to work. So sometimes I can be even more distant from people, mm -hmm. right? Because, and, it, and this is where ENTJs naturally struggle more so than a person who prefers ESTJ because the, uh, the STJ is here now I can perceive what's going on now. Now, as the ENTJ develops, right, as a person who prefers ENTJ or whether it develops, what you're going to get is someone who's more grounded in reality with SC, right? So as I've gotten older, I've been able to get more into reality with SE and be more in tune with my physical surroundings. I find myself not in my head nearly as much as I used to be. And um, that's a huge thing, you know, and what I mean in my head is I'm still always trying to move an agenda forward, always trying to organize but in the sense of just being in my mind, right? Uh, looking at abstractions. I'm always looking at things that people are releasing to me and seeing how those things, I can execute the agenda that I have at the top of my mind. And so always looking for patterns that are relevant to that particular agenda. If I need to take control of a room, the abstractions are released to me in a way of being able to do that. Okay, so there, there are certain things that, in a, that kind of removes you from the rest of the world. Here, here's why the NJs struggle, right? Whereas the SJs may not, that may not come as natural to them. So there's there's a di big difference in, in this type. And yet, if you compare me with somebody else who prefers ENTJ, you may find that most of them have that natural tendency, but some of them have gotten over it, developed SE better than me, maybe, or you know developed FI better than me, maybe, and they're able to make better decisions. There's all kinds of processes that are involved in type development. We have to understand that. We have to understand that nobody is static, okay? so. We have to remember uh, there's so many aspects of type and there's so many aspects of the human element and human variable that we can't possibly confine it to one little thing and go, you know what, it's Trey, because he's looking off right now into the distance, you know, he, he, he can't be, he can't have extroversion. He's not an extrovert at all, right? Because he can't use extroversion because Trey peers off into the distance, you know? You know, um, 
But then at the same time, Daniel, the ISTJ, right? Uh, so point is, Daniel prefers ENFJ, but a lot of people have picked up this ISTJ type of vibe from him because of, think about this, how is he using FE? How is Daniel making decisions right now or any given live discussion or any given video, right? I have confined Daniel's FE into a TE format. I'm like, hey, Daniel, here's your hype list. Here's the bullet points. Here's what you need to cover. Here's this particular topic. So Daniel forcing himself to use process, it eliminates his expression. By the way, we're working on that, right? We're trying to get through that, but it eliminates his expression. Yeah. Okay. So if we really take this in perspective, well, the people who are looking at this and going, oh, oh my God, like uh, Daniel, he must prefer ISTJ because he's, he's thinking, no, that's not the case. <laughs> Daniel is using TE, but he's not necessarily liking it. <laughs> you get what I'm yeah saying? I appreciate it I appreciate what I can do with it this is my preference now it's kind of like it takes my energy away like crazy it can burn me out like today I worked like crazy and then I, I passed out um yeah yeah can I give yeah. a quick example yep go ahead okay so whenever I was in high school one of my best friends very like in um intuitive okay always come up with grandeur ideas and he lived with me for a bit with him and probably because of you know maybe some extracurricular activities and introverted intuition is a lot stronger than other estjs and i'm thankful for that but i realized that if i spend too much time uh thinking about the future that for me i'm not going to be able to produce results and that bothers me so Blake is indicating that it's out of preference for him to use intuition. Yet, if you know Blake, he, he actually has good use of intuition. But probably if I told Blake, hey, for the next 24 hours, I don't want you to use sensing at all and all intuition. By the end of the day, that hair won't look so perfect. <laughs> he'll, be, he'll be losing it. Yeah, and he'll be losing his mind, right? Operating out of preference. That's, that's what causes stress is when you operate out of preference too long. Society has forced us to flex and adapt and stretch to different demands. And as humans, that's what we naturally do, whether it's to survive in our household, whether it's to survive in our environment or our workplace or whatever. But, you know, taking in what natural consideration, that natural preference is still there. It doesn't change, even though you may get good at something else. You may actually become so good at something else that you lose touch with that natural preference. And you forget what your natural preference is. And that happens. Right? It doesn't mean that you know any less about type theory or cognitive theory. It doesn't mean that you've lost focus on cognition. It doesn't mean that MBTI is now a mysterious cloud that you can't figure out. You may know type really well and still not know your own natural preferences. Right? You may not uncover those things. So the way to get to your natural preference, here's the tip of the night, is to think about what your life would be like when you remove all the stressful elements. Okay? If you remove everything that's stress and you had to answer to no one or nothing and you had to be in a place of your own natural person, let's say it's your own island, for example, and you got other people on the island, it's own community, but there had, there's nobody ruling it, right? It's just a bunch of people living their life or whatever. What would, you, what would your life be like? 100% free will. How would your life look? You know, if you, and to give a brief summary of this real quick, let's, let's go through this so you, people who may be struggling with it. E versus I, where are you getting your energy? Are you directing it toward the outside world? Are you directing energy that way? Are you receiving energy from the outside world? Okay, if you direct and receive energy from the outside world, you prefer extroversion. In this fairy tale life that we just made up, what do you see yourself doing? Where do you see yourself getting the most energy? Right, do you get it or do you need that time where you need to pull away and go back into retreat into yourself and get energy from the inside? That sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> Trey can explain that though, but uh, yeah, that sounds like a nightmare to me. But anyway, uh, I get energy from that, you know, by directing it outward, by interacting with the external world. That is, that is where I get my energy. Even in this call, my energy will slowly keep peaking up. Uh, as you'll, that's why I get into rants because my energy keeps going and going and going and going and it keeps growing as I get into interacting with other people and talking and putting things into the outer world. So that's where a lot of my energy comes from. But think about the natural world. Think about what you got to do in reality, right? What do you have to do? What, what do you have to do in reality that you're not uh, in this fairy tale land? What are you doing? What about N versus S, right? If you're looking at intuition versus sensing, 
Where, where are you getting your, your ideas from? How are you bringing in information? Which one do you trust most in your fairy tale land that you just created? Which one comes more natural to you? Do you trust your experience more than your inspiration or do you entrust your inspiration more than your experience in this fairy tale land? Right. You know, um, if you find that experience is, is, is the, is what you rely on and it's what's more that you might actually prefer sensing that that's not the only facet of sensing. Of course, there's many different facets of sensing, but that's one example of that small variation. Right. So you got to think about it. How would it be? Would you naturally look at the abstractions? My mind's eyes always on the, the conceptual stuff. So the details tend to stress me out. And Daniel and uh, uh, Trey have learned this, that I don't like excessive details. And the more detailed you get, the more my mind it disconnects from what the hell you're saying. And uh, so I like snapshot information. I want it that way and that's it. I don't want all the details. I try to remove myself from that because that's not my natural preference. And I'm trying to grow into that, but it's very stressful for me. Details are very stressful, as well as feelings. Feelings completely wear me out. Point being is T versus F, how would you make your decisions? Would you incorporate the logic side first or would you incorporate the feeling side first? What's most important? What comes most natural to you? What's a stressful for you? Which part is more stressful? I find that human information distorts good decisions a lot. I prefer logic clearly. Um, you know, there's no question on my fairy tale and how it would be ruled. You know, I was I was gonna input something really quick. Something that I, one of the things that I had recognized was a uh, a big part in determining that I was INFJ or I preferred INFJ was when I realized that everything that I would explain or a lot of the things that I would logically justify had a feeling in the beginning, and so a lot of the thoughts I had, like maybe I would think, oh, this is how this should be or something like that, and then I would. I would attempt to make that happen, not thinking of it in a logical format in the beginning, but if someone asked me to break it down, I could break it down for you. And uh, even if I couldn't break it down at the moment, like, or maybe I would say it and then I'd try to break it down because I knew they were going to ask me in a minute. You see what I mean? So like a lot of the things that I would think um, came with a feeling first and then I would, I would have a logical justification for that afterwards so yeah Trey we, we gossiped about you all the beginning of this video so I, I was listening actually yeah, so. <laughs> I was getting groceries <laughs> yeah so that's just just keep in mind that we we uh, we bad mouthed you all in the beginning of this video we're, we're trying to get it all out before oh. we arrived actually I want to say something earlier you guys were talking about um, masculinity and femininity right well you actually really just talk about masculinity but I was just gonna say that I was thinking about that today and um, and how the ESTJ a lot of times is portrayed as the most masculine type. Um, and the reason that would, would be because of the uh, standards we have set for masculinity or what a lot of people perceive masculinity to be, right? And so uh, the ESTJ comes across as the most masculine type. But what I was thinking about today was uh, what would be the most feminine type? And when I thought about it, I was thinking it might be like ENFJ, right? But then I was thinking about how I was thinking about how if you took if you took ESTJ and you flipped the uh, orientation of the functions, then you'd have ISTP, which is also kind of a uh, a lot of people see them as like. Well, I don't really know the word. If you're talking about energies. If you're talking about energies, INFP is actually energy yeah. wise. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. Yeah, my conclusion. My conclusion. I actually came around to uh, INFP and INFJ, and then I was going to ask you uh, because of that conclusion because. And that was just based off of like personal data, right? It was like yeah. which one's more feminine. And so I was going to ask you, do you think the introversion is um, more of a feminine trait? Yes. And uh, uh, extroversion? I, don't, I wouldn't say feminine. I would say feminine energy. I don't want to say feminine because it's not like you're a, you're an effeminate male. But if you prefer introversion, it's typically not seen as alpha. Okay. So you see what I mean? That's, that's the societal depiction of it. I don't want to say that. It's more of a feminine energy which is the world of creative thought, the world of abstraction, it's the world of uh, creativity, the mind's conceptual analysis, intuition, all that stuff is considered feminine energy. Hence why the ENTJ falls under ESTJ as far as masculine energy goes. I happen to have just a, a ridiculous amount of masculine energy to the point where I often shut off my intuition because it's just the energy that's in me. Daniel talks about this in his dating and relationships videos as well. 
and he's going to expound on this stuff more as the energies in masculine and feminine energies doesn't mean male or female so let's get that out of our head this is not a, a sexist discussion this is more about energies and there's a lot of stuff on it and uh, so when you when you do it i like in what i mean when you do it when you start looking into it rather you start seeing okay yeah i there's supposed to be a healthy balance and ideally we bring both sides to create a whole uh, I'm too far slanted one way as far as my own personal development goes. I need to start working on embracing the other side. But there is a lot of uh, aspect of it that, yeah, it, it, if you look at it from a from a typology standpoint, ESTJ, the letters are all the the uh, masculine letters, and then the the P, F, N, and I are the particular feminine letters. Um, so yeah, it's just the opposite on on the sense of typology. Now the cognitive functions. I don't think there's any function that's associated with feminine directly. Um, I, I think it's just more of the typology standpoint, extroversion, sensing, uh, judging, and thinking from a, from a typology standpoint. From functionally speaking, this is where the variations come into play. So there's a lot on the subject. I really don't want to move into this, this category too much as far as energy goes, because it's not the topic here. The topic is here staying on, on type and making sure that type is the, the thing that I want to make sure people clear up. Because I saw a lot of comments like, why are you guys using the word prefer? That's the point of this video is we want to talk about the word prefer. We want to, what that means. And I think we've cleared a lot of that up. But ultimately understanding that we're not, most people are not going to fit these uh, descriptions completely. I've done probably around 100 different uh, typing sessions, if not more. I haven't counted, but um, probably at least 100. And in each one, uh, I've never, I've met very few people that are like, that's me 100%. At the end, we usually compare two types or three types sometimes, and it, I they rate them like that's about 80% me, that's about you know 70% me, and that's 95% me. Very few people are like that's 100% me, and these are personal variations. Okay, so that is normal. All right, so having personal variations. Sometimes life teaches you that maybe experience is more important than inspiration, or maybe you had the drill sergeant dad who made your life just so sensing oriented that you naturally learn to you know trust your own experience or your own knowledge over intuition because he told you you were stupid every day that you made an intuitive decision as opposed to a regular um, sensing decision which was regular to him but not regular to you or your natural preference right so we've got to keep that stuff in mind daniel any comments on prefer on preference yeah anything um I mean, yeah, I don't want to dabble into masculine and feminine energy, but I just wanted to let everybody know that you can be any type, like you, I think you mentioned, and, and you can be any kind of energy, whether you're a girl or a guy. And um, whether there's correlations to type with, with gender, I can't say, um, because there's, there's been no study on that. But from my observations, you know, uh, ESTJs, uh, they tend to be a little bit more masculine. ENTJs tend to be a little bit more masculine. Uh, the INFJs and INFPs and ISFPs and ISFJs that I've, you know, come across, they've been predominantly, you know, feminine, you know, feministic and, and, and their behavior is, is feminine, you know. Um, so, but the idea is to, to stem away from those stigmas and, and to not create those assumptions until you know that person, right? right. To, until you really want to get to know them, right? Ask them questions, you know, validate your own way of understanding them and, let them know, let, let whoever you know, whether it's, you're talking about MBTI or, or anything in life, you know, make sure you let the other person know that you understand them, right? And that you're on the same page. Uh, because if you're not, then, you know, it leads to a lot of ambiguity and lack of trust because it, it shows how much this person does not really want to get to know you, you know? And so for me as a coach, it's really important for me to always actively listen, to always try to understand where my clients are coming from, because without understanding where my clients come from or, or anybody for that matter, you know, how, how much can I really connect to that person, you know, on a humane level? Right. Yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's what I mean. So we got to move away from stigmas and that stigmas in sexism, that stigmas in MBTI, that stigmas in anything else that we speak of. Okay. We're not perfect. None of us at MBTV are. Oh, and we make mistakes. I often will contradict myself. I'll say something and then somebody will say, hey, you said that. Uh, yeah, I made a mistake. You know, and I mean that. I, I'm, I'm human. I make mistakes. And as I grow and change, six months ago, I don't know as I knew, know, knew nowhere near what I know now. That's the thing. You know, and six months ago was a huge change. And even my, my understanding of everything as far as, you know, typology goes and 
NLP and psychology and whatever else. So we're always in a growing stage. So you're going to see things that I often correct myself. I may make a mistake and I go, Ugh. you know, I don't even want to watch my old videos because of those. We leave them up, but thank God they have a date on them. You know, so if anybody goes, hey, <laughs> that's wrong. And I'll be like, yeah, you're right. It is wrong. I, but I leave the video up. The point is, you know, we grow and I leave those. I left those videos, videos up from day one for you guys to see that it is the growing journey. If you look at my old videos compared to now, you'll see quite a change. They're over a year old and you'll see just a, a, a pretty big change. And I'm not saying it's necessarily positive. It's just a change. And the key is just understand that we are always on a developmental growth. And that's why you can't say, oh, this type would never do that. Well, you know what? An ENTJ will never listen to your feelings. Wait a second. Okay, so <laughs> you get where I'm going with that, right? It, you, you just can't you can't just sum it up with like that. That's that's too much. Now, this book recognizes why people are have people have problems, right? Potential areas for growth. It recognizes that some people, including, check this out. Okay, hold on. I want you guys to see this real quick. So. Uh, this is a really good book. I use this book so many times. In fact, I've used it so many times that the cover fell off. So just get an idea of how many times I've actually opened this book. But the idea is if you look at INFJ, let's look use Trey as an example, right? Let's we'll check this out. If an INFJ has not developed their feeling, so they may not have reliable ways of making decisions and accomplishing their goals, then their valuable insights and creativity stay locked inside. So what this is saying is you can prefer INFJ and still suck at feeling, right? So I've talked about, you know, functions don't equal strengths. Um, now, socionics a little bit different, but as far as uh, MBTI goes and MBTI's theory model they use for MBTI, uh, you can not, you can actually suck at your dominant and tertiary and auxiliary and inferior function. You can suck at life in general. And still, <laughs> still prefer INFJ, right? Not that INFJ suck at life. So the idea is you can ultimately suck at life just by, it's not about, it's about what you prefer, right? If you never use the tool, you're probably not going to get good at it. You're not, you're probably not going to develop it very well. It's going to be, it's going to struggle quite a bit, right? So like we were talking about earlier, Trey shutting off his FE because it wasn't effective, right? Do you think that he shut it off? So naturally it's kind of dissipated. But one of the thing is that he has a natural preference for it. So let's say that as a kid, I was born left-handed. I didn't get disciplined about my left hand. So I'm left-handed. I write with my left hand. Now imagine somebody hit me with a ruler whoosh, every time I touched something with my left hand, right? Right. So I learned to write with my right hand and I'm writing with it and I get really good at it. But my left hand doesn't know how to write because I never learned it. Right. But if you were to put a pencil in my left hand and to teach my left hand how to write again, it would learn probably faster than my right hand. It would move faster. Because that's how it's your brain is wired. That's how my body was wired. It was hardwired for my left hand. So if it took me three years to write really well with my right hand, it might take a year and a half to write really well with my left hand. Point is that natural preference is still there. That being said, Trey, if he starts targeting his feeling, if his feeling actually did get underdeveloped, then he's probably going to learn it a lot faster than say me, which will probably take another 10 to 15 years to be like a normal human being as far as my feeling goes. So Point is, it, because it's out of preference, it's going to take me a lot longer. And Disclaimer, ENTJs are not human. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I talked to Trey about that earlier. You know, we, we struggle with humanity. And Blake is not human either. ESTJs are not human. So us two, not human. But point is, you guys got to understand it's about preference. Okay, so our brains are wired. If you read Kiersey, you know, there's four different types of brains. Essentially, you've got your strategic, you've got your diplomatic, you've got your tactical, and you've got your logistical side. Okay, so the strategic is your NTs, the, uh, the logistical is the SJs, you know, you've got your, your SPs, which are your tactical, and then you've got your diplomat, which is your NFs. Okay, so that, if you understand that that's, your brain is hardwired, the further you stretch away from your core brain type, in a sense, the harder it's going to be and more stress it's going to cause you. So if you take a, a strategy person like me, a strategician, strategist, and take this person and go, okay, I want you to operate as a SJ, a logistical person, that causes a tremendous amount of stress on somebody who prefers strategy. Okay. And then you add on top of that, the feeling preference. Now they're logistics as far as human dynamics go. <laughs> and you force them into introversion. That's where the most stress is going to cause. Essentially, if you take the, the ENTJ and you change all the letters, ISFJ, right? Or rather ISFJ, 
except the last letter. Change all the letters except the last one. That's the furthest away you can get from your core type. Okay, so um, that's the one that they struggle with the most. That's the furthest stretch. So the first three letters, just flip them, and that's going to be your stretch type, as far as I can tell. You know, I didn't do all the types to be sure, but that should be your stress type. So that being said, you know, you, you're going to have a type that, that's going to really stress you out. So if you tried to, if I could flex to ISFJ for maybe an hour, maybe <laughs> an hour. And uh, yeah, that's, that's quite a stretch asking me to do that. I don't even, I think I'd suck at it pretty good. I would want to see it. I would try though. I would try for the sake of experimentation, but um, it would be a real struggle to dominate with SI, move into FE. Um, that's actually so unnatural. I don't even know if I could do it, but I could try. Whereas if you look at all the other types like INFJ and you ask them to stretch over, you're going to look at, okay, he have to stretch to ESTJ. The day that Trey acts like Blake will be the day that my, my uh, mind is blown. Same. Yeah. My mind will be completely blown. Let's do it, Trey. Yeah. And Blake, you got to act like Trey. If you can do this successfully, and actually do it, though. You can't just fake it. You can't fake the behavior. You actually have to do it. You have to actually have to space out, Blake. And if Blake can actually space You're out... Getting close. You're getting close, Blake. Blake, you've got to start talking, and then you got to space out. you got, you got to have my droopy eyelids so it looks like you're, you're high at the same time. Yeah. So we've got, to, we've, got to make sure, we've got to make sure that we understand that we're stretching our brains to these other types. Now, the Kiersey model says you probably should stay within your role. Ideally, you know, maybe flex a little bit, but don't go too far. It's too much stress on the brain. Hire other people to do that. And it's the same thing with sociomics. MBTI is the only one that actually suggests to develop all the functions and, you know, to get better at that. I don't know about that because it causes a lot of stress. I do believe that you should stretch a little bit and learn how to use those functions effectively. But as far as like trying to make them as strong as your dominant, I, um, I don't know yet. And to answer earlier question, uh, yes, we're going to do videos on looping and advanced type dynamics. Uh, that's a that's a particular topic I'm working on, as well as incorporating other things like socionics and different models and understanding type theory. So whoever asked that, that is the answer to that question. I know it's, it was like 30 minutes ago, but the point being is you've got to have that. Uh, we've got to go cover that stuff. So this live stream, my objective was simply to cover the fact that type is not stagnant, which means your type core type is but you will grow and change and you'll start looking a lot less like your type to other people, but at the core, you're still you, right? And you're still, you still have those preferences. You just might look like somebody else. You throw, you throw an INFP into a workplace long enough, 30, 40 years, they may look like ESTJ, but when they go home, they're like, thank God that's over. I'm tired. I don't, you know, I don't want to do that all day. You know, I'll do what I have to do to survive and make my pay my living and all that, but I'm, I'm done. I want to check out. Lazy. Yeah, Blake, Blake is thinking pathetic. Unproductive swine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, okay, uh, guys, I'm working on, you know, making sure you guys get plenty of airtime too. I'm trying to not take all the airtime. I know a lot of people like what I have to say, but sometimes <laughs> I don't like all the stuff I have to say. So let's, uh, let's get one of you guys on. Trey, stop eating your arm. Man, that was funny. <laughs> All right, so Daniel, anything to add? Because I can go on. No, no, I, I react so much better to questions. I, you know, that's how I tap into my intuition. If somebody asks me a question, I, I can like, I can write a book, but I, I can't just like go off nothing. What is the meaning of life? You sound like oh. a robot. <laughs> yeah, your audio is messed up, Daniel. Is it really? Um, really but you should ask me questions. You should ask me yeah. questions and I'll respond. Okay. Blake, any thoughts to what I said? And he shuts off his microphone. <laughs> his microphone is off right now. He literally, right when I asked him, he shut off his microphone. No, no. Okay. Any thoughts to what you just said? Well, I've been right. taking this this entire time because you got some good stuff to share. You guys are on the stream. If you got a free hand, take notes. If you got a free hand, I know he's just so handsome. I don't have a free hand. I'm thinking. Oh. Okay, so I had a question. But here. um, go ahead, Blake. Sure. Sure. Questions. 
Oh, okay, never mind. All right, so I thought you had something to say, so I'm, I'm going to go on here. Uh, somebody asked us, Chad, talk about ENTJs and to get along with your ESFJ mother. Um, okay, so Elizabeth, you know, I still go by Damon. Damon's my, my name, but Chad is uh, my legal name, just to clear that up. So I'll go by both, but I prefer Damon, just so you know. And, uh, but I will, I will say the opposite, but it really, at the end of the day, it, it depends. Like you can't, again, that's like saying, how do, how do, how does a, a white person get along with a black person? Anybody want to take a shot at answering that question? They don't. <laughs> Come on guys. So the point is, I don't know. <laughs> the point is it's, wait, such, it's, such a, it's such a broad category. Uh, it's very hard to answer that question. Uh, it's such a broad category. You can't possibly take somebody and you can't possibly go, how does uh, somebody from America get along with somebody from Europe? Well, there's a fundamental thing that's probably necessary is to be human, right? And I don't mean just be physically human. I mean, actually treat them like human beings. So if an ESFJ enters an ENTJ's life, treat them like they're human. That's, that's all you need to do is, is consider that. You know, stretch- Just appreciate their presence. Yeah, uh, appreciate their differences, right? Yeah. You know, that's all, and, it is. Uh, that's all it is. And if we can get past these stigmas and stop drawing lines between stuff and uh, stop, stop drawing these lines, then there's, there'll be less segregation. Oh, I don't talk to ESFJs. You know, it's true that ESFJs is, can be a stretch because of the different preferences. It can be a stretch. I'm not going to deny that that stretch doesn't exist. It, it, it can be a stretch. But the difference, the key is, to remember at the end of the day, this person has a world of insight of their own. They have a world of beliefs of their own. They have a journey they're following on their own. And they just probably could use another friend. Yeah. Right? Trey is, I don't know what's wrong with Trey, but he's laughing at everything right now. Um, so. You know, the idea too, Damon, is uh, everybody, everybody's their own person, like you said. Right? But as you, you know, you, use, you should use typology. You should use your your observations, how you connect with the world to appreciate people always, you know. And uh, for me, you know, the basis of, you know, researching MBTI and Daniel, can, you hang on one, can you hang on one yeah. second? Uh, yeah. Trey, does Daniel sound, his audio sound mess up or is that on my end? No, nah, man, he's a robot. He sounds yeah, like it terrible. Like an ISTP. <laughs> wait, wait. How many yeah, yeah. Daniel, Daniel leave off real quick and then get back on. Um, okay. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, okay. so we'll hold Daniel's thought real quick. Okay, so Blake, uh, I, I have a question specifically for you. Is I think you, you know, a lot of people have said you've developed intuition. I think this may be a result of you being around a lot of people who prefer intuition. Um, no, that, that's totally it. Right. Yeah. And, I, you know, because from what I understand, you spent a lot of time with Trey, then you had the roommate that preferred intuition. So it sounds like you've just been around a lot of people who prefer intuition. Before Trey, before Trey, it was hanging out with a lot of intuition. Yeah. Yeah, so Blake And my is, mom, too. His, uh, his, his friend Xavier is an ENFP, and he's like, he's like, he's really ENFP. <laughs> like, he's like, he fits the book, man. <laughs> he's just, he's something else. I mean, he doesn't like, it's kind of funny because he he's like a really cool dude and he like freeloads everyone like <laughs> in a really cool way it's like it's like he just he'll go outside and he'll like have spent the night with a friend for example he'll go outside and he'll walk everywhere and enjoy the morning and then he'll like go find a friend and he'll like borrow their like fruit that they never eat you know the little fruit basket in people's houses that they never eat he'll like go there and he'll like take one of their fruits and be like can i have one of these and like and he's like really cool and anytime you see him um, he'll always be interested in what you're talking about. He's like, I mean, he's just, he's just a very, um, he's a very interesting dude. I don't know. He's the really friendliest cool. person you will meet. Okay. Uh, the friendliest person you will meet. That's, that's the guy. Um, I've always, I've always looked up to him on how he can, you know, just build relationships so well and connect with people. And, um, I just, I just looked at his life though and look, look at a, you know, uh, it's not like I, I, it doesn't resonate with me, you know. His uh, his goals and his pursuits they don't resonate with me. It's kind of hard to like see him as um, a mentor in certain areas. Because although he's better uh, than me at something, uh, I still I still can't just like 
myself, my soul can't really trust and change me. Mm -hmm. Teach me. Yeah, those, those natural, those natural preferences don't change, even though you can learn to appreciate his differences. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing It's getting in touch with yourself and not just using it as an excuse to not flex or not stretch, but really just getting in touch with your own core preferences and realize this is my preference. How do I operate out of preference? Blake surrounded himself with a bunch of people who preferred intuition. Therefore, he probably has a little more ability to use intuition effectively. Whereas some people who prefer intuition may actually have had their intuition repressed and they look more like a person who prefers sensing. So there's no way on the surface to really determine this. So if you guys, I know you all do this, you're all guilty as charged. I pretty much will convict every single person who's into typology. You type your friends, right? Everybody types their friends. If you're into typology, you type your friends. It's not true. Okay, Daniel, you're the exception. There's always the exception, and Daniel's the exception. I don't type anything. Because you know what? Okay. You, you know what it is, Damon, at the end of the day, I already understand people regardless. At the end of the day, your audience. Okay, robots. At the end of the day, your audio still sucks. I told you to log off and then log back on. I can't because I'm, I'm in control of this broadcast, so if I leave, everything ends. No, it doesn't because I'm in control of the broadcast, so you just exit. Close no, that's what it said in the button. Use your iPhone. Daniel, Use your iPhone. the damn broadcast. <laughs> Use your iPhone, Daniel. Just close your browser and then come back on. Okay. <laughs> there, see? Did the broadcast end? No, it didn't. All right. So... It says that live. Thing, yeah, it's still live. Uh, I mean, it says live in my window, right? And I'm people, just, people I'm just still, Yeah, it's Daniel's fault. So, <laughs> point is, you know, um, yeah. So when you when you're typing.